anybody hear me? Okay, great. So we have all this vision, right, of a decentralized, trustless intermediary. And I believe many of us are actually also in this room because they, they kind of want to bring society towards a, well, towards a society where you can trade with someone without needing to trust him, right? I think this is, a, I, at least for, for me personally, it's very motivating. Uh, so you have kind of this cloud in the, in the middle between two parties and you are still able to send uh, financial assets uh, to each other. Um, and the best thing would be that you're actually custodian of your funds, meaning if you're custodian of your funds, you own them, you hold them, right? Nobody else is holding them. So if somebody goes offline, you won't lose your funds, right? Uh, there's no bank uh, which is sitting in the middle that is actually responsible for the security of your funds. Um, it's kind of a cloud of a, of a de decentralized network. So the problem with these decentralized networks, as you have seen in particular proof-of-work blockchains, which are like, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they don't scale. You have maybe 10 transactions per second. And in my PhD, I try to analyze the security of proof-of-work blockchains. And you, you could see that you can scale maybe to 100 transactions per second if you tweak some parameters, maybe to 1,000 transactions per second if you really enhance the network connecti connectivity between miners. But that's it. So if you want to scale further, you need some other means. Um, and we still don't want to compromise on the decentralized nature. We don't want to go back to, to one single entity that, that we trust, right? So you will see a lot of scaling solutions out there that say, hey, we can scale to 10,000 transactions per second. Um, it's simple. It works today. Uh, but most of these projects, uh, if you're looking a bit closer to them, um, they actually do compromise on the decentralization aspect, on the, on the, trust, on the trust aspect, right? Um, so today we're going to talk about centralized but untrusted intermediaries. So I believe this is a design space that hasn't been looked at a lot. Um, so you can think of it, there's still a kind of a bank, but this bank doesn't hold your funds anymore. The only purpose of this bank is to help you communicate with other people, right? So if I'm sending to you some assets, I'm sending it this over this centralized intermediary, but if this centralized intermediary goes down or leaves, leaves the room, nothing will happen. We can still recover our funds securely uh, without losing anything. That's, that's the key. Um, and in particular, the, the thing that we're talking today are so-called payment hubs. So the liquidity payment hub, which is fully explained in our academic paper, NoCast, uh, you can think of it visually like this. So you have like different participants in a particular hub. So there some might be on the mobile phone, some might be on their desktop or web app. And a particular, a particular user here can register off-chain with this hub, right? So which, what, what does it mean, off-chain registration? It means I'm sending a message. More technically, it's a signed TCP message from my client with my private key that I own because I'm custodian to this centralized entity, okay? So nobody, nobody else will see this message. It's only between the hub and me at this, at this current state. Um, and it's not going over blockchain. So if it's not going over blockchain, it means I don't need crypto to do that. So I can join this network without having crypto. And once I've joined this network, I can receive from another participant so-called off-chain funds. Again, this is not a transfer over the blockchain, but it's a transfer secured by the blockchain. And then I can forward this to another participant that is also a member of this particular uh, payment hub. So just to give you the high-level picture first, uh, before we, we look at the uh, concrete example, so you have a blockchain. This is the underlying root of trust. Okay? And it can be a very slow one. It can be Bitcoin. It can be Ethereum, right? Something that, that supports kind of programmatic smart contracts. Um, and that might be very volatile in terms of transaction fees. The transaction fees, they can be volatile between a few cents to 50 US dollar, that's fine. Um, and if you want to build your business on top of such a blockchain or your application on top of such a blockchain, you will be exposed to these variations and the users of your system will be exposed to these variations. So where a payment hub could come in is on top of this. So a payment hub would allow you to do, for example, 10,000 transactions per second among all users of this particular payment hub it would allow you to do zero fee transactions. Uh, you can have actually faster confirmations than on the underlying blockchain. And because of these guarantees, you can have service level agreements. You can have a guaranteed uptime. You can have a guaranteed amount of, um, of uh, transactions per second, a guaranteed 
uh, yeah, guaranteed fees per second, so for example, zero fees. Um, and all this by kind of abstracting away, by, by, by combining the off-chain transactions and only using the blockchain at rare moments. I will explain this a bit later in detail. So our vision is that it's liquidity is kind of a plug and play scalability solution for, for example, wallet provider, decentralized exchanges, um, if you want to power your app with some blockchain payments, also centralized exchanges and uh, financial liquidity providers, which are often needed in, in for example, in, in nowadays DEXs that we see. So just to give you a concrete example, how, how does this work? So we developed a proof of concept app, uh, which you can find on iOS and on, on, the, uh, on the Google Play Store. And it's, it's very similar to a traditional crypto wallet. So you basically just create your wallet, you use an authentication method, for example, your fingerprint, and then you're there. So now you have your wallet open. So what does this mean? Does this mean I'm already connected to the off-chain hub? Yes, you are. So basically, the moment that you open this app, you do an off-chain registration with the centralized but untrusted intermediary. And the very moment that this app is open, you can already receive off-chain funds securely. You don't need any on-chain crypto, so user onboarding is really easy. So if you have an app that you want to use crypto, um, you wouldn't need your users to use crypto, uh, to have crypto before uh, engaging with your, with your system. Um, so I want to show you here basically the differentiation between what is liquid ETH and what is ETH. So we call liquid ETH the off-chain version of Ether. So you can think of this, this is the ether that is committed periodically to the blockchain, um, but the transactions of liquid ether themselves, they're actually free and instant. And this is the traditional on-chain ether that everybody knows about. So no, no big difference. It's important that one liquid ETH is equal to one ETH. That's basically what the smart contract of the, of the payment hub uh, enforces, and I will go into details in a bit. But before, I want to show you a little demo. So if you click here, for example, on get some free money, we have a fossé, and this fossé allows you to receive off-chain crypto. And in this particular example here, currently, if you install this app, you get 100 way. Does anybody know how much 100 way is? Or how much ether is one way? Anybody knows? It's 10 to the power of minus 18 ether. So it's a minuscule amount. It's really like nothing, right? Uh, and the reason we send out nothing or almost nothing is to show that you can actually send almost nothing because there are no transaction fees involved. Right? So that's, that's, the, that's the point of, of doing this. And you can send this further to another participant um, that might have the same wallet or another wallet that accepts off-chain crypto. Okay, so how, how does this work? So let's, let's get a bit technical. Um, so as I mentioned, we're building up on a blockchain, right? So this can be, for example, Ethereum or Bitcoin, any, any type of proof-of-work blockchain. It should, however, support smart contracts. Um, so that's the smart contract. So there's a no-cost smart, co smart contract that we have developed. And there's a no-cost uh, server. And this is where I mentioned, this is the centralized but untrusted intermediary. So why is it untrusted? Well, because the smart contract here will verify the operations of the server. So the server is basically bound by what the smart contract will allow it to do. And uh, the different participants that, that can interact with, the, with this uh, smart contract and the server, for example, here, Bob and Alice. And let's go through the example where Bob sends Alice some amount of crypto. So let's assume for this example that Bob has one Ether on the Ethereum blockchain. And this one Ether is on-chain. Okay? So on-chain transactions are slow and cost gas fees to the miners. So in order to use this Ether off-chain, what Bob will do, he deposits this one Ether within the no-cost smart contract. Okay? It's a simple on-chain transaction. This costs fee. But once he's in this world, in this off-chain world, he can use this and send it actually to anyone within this system at no charge. So, and how does he do this? So the, technically, what Bob does, he signs cryptographically an IOU. Um, so I guess some of you are familiar. IOU is just a term for I owe you some funds. Um, from Bob to Alice, let's say 0 0.1 Ether. Next thing is the Noca server signs this particular IOU. So the Noca server says, good, I approve this. And I forward this to Alice. And the moment that Alice receives this particular IOU, she can enforce this IOU in the smart contract if she wants to. 
Okay, that's very important. So this means you have instant finality of this particular transmission if and only if Alice is able to get the funds out of this IU if she goes to the smart contract, right? Let's say the server dies, goes away, runs away, whatever. Um, then Alice can still go to the smart contract and say, hey, I have this IU. It's signed by Bob. It's signed by the server. I, 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 I want my funds, right? Um, so what the NoCast server does at periodic time intervals, so the current um, mainnet version that we have on Ethereum does this every 36 hours. So every 36 hours, the server takes all the IUs, he compresses them in a sense, and commits them to the blockchain. One Ether transaction for as many off-chain IOU transactions that you want on top of it. Okay? And that's why we can basically be cheaper um, and, and, and more efficient than, than simple on-chain transactions. So the Anoka server updates the balances of all the participants every 36 hours within the smart contract and validates also the, the IUs. Um, so now the user, what, so what Alice can do here, for example, she can go to the smart contract and check, did I actually, did this 0.1 Ether that I got from an IUU from Bob, was this actually now committed on the chain? She can always observe, right? Uh, that's always possible. Okay. Um, and if there's an issue, I, Alice can, can enforce the IAU as I mentioned earlier. So how do we compress now these IAUs uh, from a technical perspective? What's the, what's the process of, of compression of IAUs? So what we invented is a so-called bimodal ledger structure. So you can think of it's kind of an, an array, so which goes from zero to here, 36 ether, and it divides intervals for specific accounts. So account number one has 10 ether because it goes from zero to 10. That's an exclusive allotment. There's nothing like intersecting or shared with any other participant here, right? This is exclusive, very important. So account number two, again, has 10 ether. Account number three has five and so on, right? So if you own a certain off-chain balance within the no-cast smart contract, then you should be registered somewhere here, right? Um, but now, how do we checkpoint this? I mean, this, this data structure will grow with time, right? I mean, the more participants you have, the bigger it will get. So that's not very efficient. You can't just take this and commit it to the smart contract. So we built an augmented Merkle tree, which basically contains uh, individual balances here. And as Ralph Merkle built its trees, the topmost element of a Merkle tree is the Merkle root. So that's a constant size hash. And this is what we commit to the blockchain. Okay, so that's the checkpoint. So, and this means this checkpoint is constant size, irrespective of the number of users that are actually participating in the, in the payment hub. Okay, so this can scale, that's great. We like scalability. Okay, but you might ask, uh, well, is this secure? I mean, every 36 hours, what happens if the server goes down and so on? So let's discuss a bit security. Um, the first thing before digging a bit deeper into security is the collateral requirements and the, the definition of instant finality. So different people define instant finality in different terms. So I would like to define it so that we speak the same language uh, or, or that I adapt to, to your language if we discuss later. Um, but I would say instant finality is basically if I receive an IU or I receive a transaction, and I accept it immediately, so I can hand over the goods immediately as a merchant, um, I would only do that if it's very unlikely that my funds are lost, right? So if you receive an IBAN transfer, um, you will wait, right? Until you receive this IBAN transfer, it shows up in your, in your banking app, and only then you will ship your goods that you're selling as a merchant. So instant finality is literally the, the point in time, I mean, if the point in time of receiving the transaction and it's being confirmed is kind of minuscule. So in order to achieve instant finality within our setting here, within this payment hub, what we need is that the sum of funds received by all users, so you remember this hub with all the users? So if, if all the users, they will receive a certain amount of funds from the hub, right? So th what needs to be collateralized within the smart contract is the sum of funds received by all users within two rounds. Two rounds being uh, the checkpoint is every 36 hours, so it's 72 hours in this particular example. So the, the technical details are in the NOCAS paper, but this is the requirement for, uh, for trustless instant finality uh, for IOUs. So what's important to mention here is that this collateral that we have, 
uh, it's very typical of payment channels. Who is familiar with payment channels? Okay, a few. So in Lightning, or like this is a payment channel, a two-party payment channel, you collateralize everything, 100% of the transaction volume that you would like to transact between two parties, right? In NoCast, you collateralize the transaction volume of a time period, okay? So if you collateralize 10 Ether for one particular user, then this is, this is valid for 72 hours, and you can use it again the next 72 hours, and again, right? So you don't need more collateral to do more transactions. So that's why the collateral requirement here are, uh, I would say, time-based or time interval-based, uh, and therefore more efficient than in, uh, in, in regular two-party payment channels. Good, but what happens now if, for example, the NOCA server disappears, okay? So we still have our architecture, the blockchain, smart contract, and the server here. And let's denote time here on the x-axis, and time starts at the Genesis checkpoint. So I just named this after Genesis checkpoint because people are familiar with the term Genesis block, right, for being the first block in a blockchain. Um, so let's say this is the first checkpoint that this hub server commits to the blockchain. And let's assume there are a few transactions that are being um, conducted off-chain. These transactions are off-chain, so these are IUUs. All right, so they are floating around. They're not yet committed to the chain. So they're similar to non-confirmed blockchain transactions, right? Transactions that are in the mempool, for example. Um, so after 36 hours, the server will say, good, I'm, I'm gonna take all these. So he's gonna take this balance structure that he built, right? With the different uh, intervals. If you recall the figure, he's doing the Merkle tree to get the Merkle root. The Merkle root is a constant size hash commits it to the chain. One transaction, constant, si constant size, uh, $2.2 currently, roughly, at the gas prices. Okay, this happens again and again. And let's assume that after this, after this checkpoint here, this one in time, the server disappears. Okay, he really goes offline. He doesn't do anything malicious at this point, he just disappears. And there were no transactions that were performed. So are these secure? these transactions, what do you think? Are they committed? So, uh, transaction one to 200 are committed on chain, right? Because they were committed in the checkpoint, they're included there. So, the users, they can actually go to the smart contract, say, hey, I, I own this particular checkpoint, uh, I own this particular, I, I got these IOUs, so I can prove I have this amount of balance, now please give me my money. Because the checkpoint, uh, the, the smart contract will always make sure that the off-chain balance is equal to the on-chain balance that is committed to the smart contract. So that's fine. We can actually take it out easily. The good thing here is there's no deadline. You can do this today. You can do this tomorrow. You can do it in a year's time. It won't run away. If you look at two-party payment channels, uh, if you close a channel, uh, so if your opponent, because you're two parties, if your opponent closes a channel, you have a certain deadline until which you, you have to make a dispute process. And that's, that might be quite tight. So there you have to run. Here you don't have to run. Okay? So that's, that's, these are important properties. Good. So this was the first example. But what happens if the NoCast server disappears after a few transactions, often transactions, have already been performed? So let's say here we have again the time interval. We have the first checkpoint. We have the second checkpoint. We have a third checkpoint. And then we have a few transactions that are executed. So in this case here, there are like uh, 200, uh, transaction number 201 to 230 that are executed within a 12-hour time frame. And at that, at that point in time, now, the server runs away. Okay? He doesn't do anything malicious again. He's just going offline. What happens now? So as before, the transactions 1 to 200 are safe. They're good, right? They are committed with the checkpoints, so no worries there. But uh, what about the, these other 29 transactions that are here not committed on chain? What do we do about them? Well, this is where the smart contract needs to back up transactions of a maximum of 72 hours, right? To basically be able to give back the, the amount of off-chain funds that are transmitted. Because otherwise, if the smart contract would not have any collateral to back them up, then these, these transactions, these off-chain transactions would be lost. Okay. So very important. If you're, if you're looking at an off-chain system, you have to understand what happens if the intermediary goes down 
And I didn't, I mean, it was never committed. My off-chain set state was never committed on chain. Okay? For any off-chain uh, technology, it's actually important that you, uh, that you ask this and understand this critically. All right, good. So the, these two examples were now with uh, a nice server, right? A server which is nice, but maybe lazy or just doesn't want to work anymore. He, he goes offline. Now we assume a server. Uh, or a client that is actually malicious, that actually wants to do harm, that wants to double spend. So double spending is the process of either creating money, stealing money from somebody, or somehow spending money to or n times. Okay. So let's assume here in this example that we have, uh, well, actually three parties. So we have Bob. Bob is malicious. And Bob has currently 50 Ether off chain. So here, this is this um, this bimodal ledger structure that I introduced earlier. Let's say it currently encodes 50 Ether from Bob. These are off-chain, okay? And on the right side, you see Alice and you see Bob Prime, which is basically, it's basically Bob, but another address of Bob. So what, what Bob would like to do, he would like to send one transaction, which is worth 50 Ether to Alice. And he would like to send another transaction, which also worth 50 Ether to himself, right? effectively double spending. So in order to double spend, or in order to make a transaction in liquidity, what's, I mean, at any point actually, you need to collude, uh, I mean, you need to have the authorization of the server. So in this particular example, for the first transaction, the server would say, yeah, sure, you have 50 ETH, no problem, let's send all this to Alice, right? The second one, however, the server will say, ah, sorry, Bob, you, all, you spent all your 50 ether, you can send it to this other address. So if the server is not colluding with Bob, the Bob cannot double spend here. Okay? That's an easy case. Now let's move on to the ne next case. Uh, the, the next case is where the Noka server colludes with Bob. Okay? So here actually the Noka server wants to help Bob to defraud another participant that is also off-chain. So the first and the second transactions here, they actually go through, right? So Alice will receive 50 Ether, and Bob, or the, the other representation of Bob, will also receive 50 Ether. But wait, how does this work? How can you create coins out of thin air? So there are two ways of doing this, right? So either Bob attempts to create coins. So the, the bimodal ledger structure here on the smart contract has 50 Ether that are encoded. If now, um, the, if now the server creates a new structure which has, for example, 100 Ether within it, right, because the server just decided to make a bigger structure, then the smart contract will say, wait, uh, server, I think you've done something bad. You have just created some coins, but I don't have 100 Ether within my smart contract. I can count my, smart con my, my Ether, right? It's on chain. Um, so you must have misbehaved. So I'm going to shut you down. Okay, so that's the first case. So the server cannot misbehave on that case. So this was the first attempt. The second attempt is to steal coins. So from whom can Bob steal coins? Well, from Alice, right? So the first transaction sends 50 ETH to Alice, and the second transaction actually doesn't send 50 ETH to Alice, but it steals 50 ETH from Alice and gives it back to Bob or to, other, to some other representation of Bob. So if, if Bob were, were about to do this, the smart contract uh, itself wouldn't actually see much. So the smart contract would just be there and say, yeah, everything is fine. Um, looks good to me. But then Alice comes around. And Alice will see, hey, I don't have, I have zero Ether now. What happened to my, to my coins? I have this IOU. This, I, this got me 50 Ether from, from Bob. And it's cryptographically signed from Bob and from the server. Therefore, they, have not, they cannot repute the fact that I got this money. So what happened with it, right? So what, what Alice is going to do, she, she will send a transaction to the smart contract and say, sorry, the server must have misbehaved here. This is, this is the IAU that I want to enforce on chain. So it's a dispute, okay? And then the, then the smart contract will basically ask the server, hey, can you say anything about this? Can you dispute it or can you, can you refute the dispute? And unless the server can't, the server goes down. Okay. So the essence here is basically that the smart contract is a mediator, right? And I mean, if you're doing business nowadays, typically everything runs smooth, right? You can work with your contractors, you with your employees, everything is fine. 
But in case of disputes, you go to court, right? Unless you settle out of court. Here's the same, right? If you have this payment system, everything goes off chain. If there's a dispute, you go to court, which is the blockchain smart contract. And the court will decide what is right, what is wrong. Okay? Good. So what are the, the costs, the operational costs of no cost? Um, so the checkpoints, I mentioned earlier, about 2.2 US dollar every 36 hours. So it's quite negligible. Uh, so the operating costs just on the blockchain for the server are like less than 50 US dollar per month. Uh, for a financial system that can support, well, as many transactions as Visa, basically, if you scale the servers properly. Um, what does the client need to store? Well, the client needs to store a few checkpoints and some date the transactions about himself. Um, what does the client need to, does the client need to be online? Yes. So in order to check if the server did everything fine, right, if the, if the server didn't cheat, the client needs to go every 36 hours online once and check is my current off-chain state, is it still in sync with what I think I have? If it's not the case, I'm gonna dispute the server, right? I'm gonna shoot it down. But if everything is fine, then I'm good, right? Uh, if you compare this to two-party payment channels, in a two-party payment channel, you have to be online all the time. It's an always online uh, requirement, whereas in no cost, you have a once every 36 hours online requirement. Um, so at the current moment, at our current implementation, you need to be online to receive a payment, right? Because you sign basically a receipt. Uh, so actually, that's also something interesting. We have cryptographically signed receipts. So this means that you cannot refute that you have received a payment, um, which might bring up some, some interesting use cases maybe for you. Um, but we are working on a version where the recipient doesn't need to be online anymore. And being online is, is kind of a big usability issue, right? You don't think of it today, right? If you send a payment through your bank transfer, you don't assume the recipient to be online. If you're, say, if you're sending Bitcoin or Ether, you don't assume the recipient to be online either. But in off-chain payments or off-chain state channels, technology, whatever, this is often a requirement that everybody is online or the recipient at least is online. And so we're working on, on, on solving this, um, hopefully this year still, the, to, to be deployed so that the recipient doesn't need to be online. Um, so some more technical details about the costs. So um, I define a, a withdrawal. So here a non-collaborative withdrawal is defined as moving from off-chain to on-chain. So if you have liquid ETH, you convert it to on-chain ETH. This is called a withdrawal. Non-collaborative means I'm not collaborating with the hub server. I'm doing this on my own. So even if the server goes down, I can just initiate a withdrawal with the smart contract. Right? I tell the smart contract, hey, I have 50 ETH off-chain. Please convert this back to my 50 on-chain ETH. Um, so and what's interesting here, if you, if you look at the x-axis, this is the number of users. right? And you have here the gas costs. Uh, uh, but probably what's more interesting for you or more readable is actually gas costs in US dollar. So we're here below 80 cents. Um, and so 10 to the power of 5 are like 100,000 users. But if you extrapolate this, so the, these measurements are actually on our, on our um, implementation. So this is actually on our current implementation. It's not, it's not something theoretical. This is actual data. Uh, so if you extrapolate this data to a billion users, then the non-collaborative withdrawal would still cost less than one dollar for a hub with one billion users. Okay, uh, one billion because this uh, this scale here is a log axis. So why is this so efficient? Do you remember the the bimodal ledger structure? We have a Merkle tree, right? So it's it's logarithmic scaling, right? The more leaves we have, the the uh, the, the base, basically the the better it scales. Okay. So this means that one particular hub, one particular payment hub here can really scale to billions of users. And that's huge, I believe, right? Because you can, you can have, uh, for your particular use case, you're not restricted in the, in the number of users. The number of transactions are also kind of only limited because of your internet bandwidth and your latency between the peers. Um, so this is all about scaling payments and, and exchanges. So everything is great, but there are obviously there's some drawbacks. So I would like to address some of the limitations that we currently have. So the non-collaborative withdrawal can take up to 72 hours. So moving off-chain funds 
back on chain, if you don't collaborate with the hub, it can take up to 72 hours. So some might say, yeah, this takes quite some time. But um, so my vision is actually that you stay off chain. Why would you ever go on chain, right? It's faster transfers, there's no, no gas costs involved. So why would you ever go back? Still, many people would like to go back because maybe they want to send their on-chain funds to some on-chain exchange and then, and then uh, swap them there with some other crypto or fiat currencies. Um, we solve this by having collaborative withdrawals. So if you collaborate with the hub, which is still there, then you can have much faster withdrawals. Um, we do have a, a collateral requirement, which is, uh, which is required for instant finality, especially if you consider building a decentralized exchange um, on, on top of liquidity and you have Binance level transaction volume, then there might be quite a, you, you will need to have quite, a, quite an important uh, collateral requirement here, right? For, I mean, the hub will have an important collateral requirement. So the benefit, however, is that, I mean, the, what we can do to fix this is to reduce the interval for the checkpoints. So if the checkpoint interval is just smaller, you need less collateral, right? So you can think of it as kind of like a block, block time interval, right? It's the same. It's just a parameter in the system. Uh, but you need to be careful to change this parameter in a way that it doesn't compromise security and the required client availability, so online presence requirement. So regarding privacy, uh, so the current hub sees all the transactions. So there's no privacy. It's basically like a bank, right? It's literally a bank that doesn't hold your funds, but it's a bank that manages your assets or that, that helps you to communicate with other peers that want to receive the assets. Um, it, I believe it's still much better than uh, on-chain privacy where you broadcast your transactions to everyone in the world and it's gonna be stored forever. Um, so here in the, in, the, in the best case, at the moment, your transaction is visible between the sender, the hub and the receiver, which is much less than the thousands of people that, that analyze the blockchain or the companies that do actually forensic uh, on top of the blockchain. Um, and at the moment, we have only a single hub instance. So Liquidity Network, if you install the app, for example, it connects to one particular hub. We, we don't have several hubs. Uh, so we don't have interconnected hubs. So this is still future research in order to do this effi as efficiently as possible because it's best to build a network, right? You, want, you don't want isolated uh, like silos or databases. You want a network where people can interact with each other. Um, so that's still uh, yeah, further work. Um, but, well, a single hub can already scale to billions of users. So the next step, um, because we, we do support off-chain transfers, the next step is off-chain swaps. So if you can transfer Ether from me to you and from you to someone else, why can't you the exchange, like uh, for example, Ether with an ERC20 token like Gnosis or whatnot? Um, and if you do this off-chain, well, it will be instant, right? It will be fast. Uh, because it's an off-chain transfer, and if you have the proper collateral set up, it's instant finality as well. Uh, and it is at zero gas fees, because it's being done off-chain, just as the payment that I mentioned earlier. So we see kind of uh, a new generation of decentralized exchanges coming up. So if you look at the first exchanges, like the DEX 1.0, uh, they were fully on-chain. So you have an on-chain order book, you have an on-chain settlement system. Um, I believe Oasis Dex is an example. I think Ether Delta in its first stages was also on-chain, on-chain. Um, so it's slow, uh, and the gas fees are uh, gas fees are required for every operation. So, for example, if you have an if you want to put in an order, like a limit order, you will need to do an on-chain transaction, even if this limit order is never executed, right? If you never have a taker for this particular order, um, so this makes the use of the system quite expensive as well as slow, right? You need to wait for a number of confirmations. For example, I don't know, a few blocks, ten, maybe 10 blocks on the Ethereum blockchain. The second class of exchanges, DEX 2.0, are partially off-chain. So what you typically see nowadays is, uh, or the, the current DEXs have an off-chain order book. So that's much faster. You can put in an order, you can take an order, it doesn't cost you any gas fees, right? Which is cool. Um, and then at some point, these are, I mean, when, 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 uh, when these are matched, then you, you, the exchange actually creates an on-chain transaction to do a settlement on-chain. So I don't like on-chain, as you might have guessed in my talk. <laughs> so on-chain means it's slow, it's expensive. So these DEXs, they won't be able to scale to Binance level, right? 
uh, but they would like to because they're trustless, right? If they go down, the users don't, don't lose their funds, which is great, right? And this is what we're all working towards, right? A vision of a decentralized system. Um, so the next generation of, of DEXs that I believe will be coming uh, about uh, really soon, and we have actually already one on the testnet, is an off-chain order book and off-chain settlement system. So the settlement system is currently the bottleneck. Let's put this off-chain. And with Liquidity Network, you can build a hub and you can do this swap off-chain. Uh, this allows you instant zero gas fees and it can really scale to, to, to levels of centralized exchanges. Um, yeah, and we are basically, we're building our own DEX to, to show how this would work. Because, yeah, if you don't see an example, you wouldn't understand how this works. Uh, but we're also offering basically our platform as a, as a settlement layer for other DEXs. So if you have a DEX and you would like to settle on, on liquidity and replace your expensive and slow on-chain settlement system, you can, you can talk to me. So that's basically what we, are, what we are looking to achieve. So we have a, a liquidity SDK and we really think that DEXs can benefit from this, wallets, apps can benefit from it and kind of use the underlying settlement system, which is off-chain, in order to increase the user experience, um, while while not require, I mean, while not rebuilding their own blockchain, right? I mean, I see many projects that are trying to build their own blockchain or side chain just for the purpose of their particular app. Um, but in Liquidity Network, there is no consensus mechanism needed, right? The security relies on the underlying blockchain, uh, which in our case currently is uh, is Ethereum. So thank you so much for for your yeah for your attention. Uh, our apps are on, on the Google Play and on the App Store. Uh, and there's also the academic paper, NoCast, is, is available here under this link. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi, Arthur. My name is Ben. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, well, it's very simple. So let's say 50 Ethereum are deposited into basically the more contract, they're now available in the balance sheet of the server. Now, as you showed, if somebody enforces the contract, wants to get money out, the, the smart contract makes them pay the fee. Is that correct? So they cannot kind of diminish the amount, the total, total available amount of chain by going out. Let's say I have 20 here and there, and I would take exactly 20, uh, then of course the fee would be missing on the other end. Um, so you you refer to I believe uh, let me quickly scroll there oh no it's not here it's here right so yes, exactly. so your process would be not the one that I'm showing here going on chain to off chain but the other way right going from off chain to on back to on chain somebody enforces or just wants to get their right so non IOU either back right so currently a withdrawal I mean if you initiate a withdrawal. Uh, with your wallet, right? You have, you say, smart contract, I have this amount of balance, I want to get this back on chain. So you initiate withdrawal, you sign this with your private key, right? You're a custodian of your funds, and you pay for the on chain transaction gas fees. So you would need to pay for this. Um, yeah, but the, the, so this is what basically what I showed here. The costs of doing so depends on how many users are within this hub, and they're always. I mean, literally always below one US dollar. Well, if, if the ether price or gas price rises a lot, then this will obviously rise as well. But if in the current system, the, the gas prices here will not grow significantly. Um, and if you're collaborating with the hub server, so basically, so the, there are two examples of how to go from off to on-chain. The first is, I don't want to talk to the server. I just talk to the blockchain. So I would just tell the smart contract, give me my money back. The other way is to tell the server, hey server, can you please send me my money? So then the server can actually create an on-chain transaction for you and send you your money, right? And this is, this is at constant gas costs. So that's also possible. So there are two ways for doing that. Thank you. My second question is, um, you know, if somebody, let's say, let you take the Visa example. Visa would say, oh, wow, it's a great thing. We want to get into crypto, whatever. We will we'll operate one of these servers. And there will be a lot of transactions since these are basically IOUs uh, and it's, you know, three party payments. So, so the server, it, what's the legal implication? What's the legal requirement to run such a server, not in your basement, but at scale? 
Yeah, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, so, uh, I mean, the legal requirements are constantly shifting, <laughs> as I guess some of you might know. Um, so my current understanding is if you operate a non-custodial wallet or non-custodial trading platform, you're not bound by AML KYC, uh, at least in Switzerland. Um, I also know about some, I, I know about a few European countries where that's the case too. Um, so as long as you're not actually custodian of the funds, which you wouldn't be as a server, right? Um, you're on the, on the legislative front, I believe things are simplified for you, at least at the moment, right? We don't know how this will change in the future. Um, so I think this is, yeah, and regarding, um, so probably your, so this is covering KYC AML. There are also regulatory aspects in terms of trading platforms, right? So if you're a trading platform for utility and payment tokens within Switzerland, I believe there it doesn't currently fall under regulations. Um, if you're, however, trading security tokens, it might. Uh, so it's still, it's still a bit grayish zone there. Um, I mean, I think it depends on who you ask, you get different answers. But yeah, I actually, the, so the interesting part is that we are not making transactions of blockchain transactions. We are making, we are, send, we are intermediating IOUs. So this simplifies some things on the legal side. That's, that's why I call it more complicated because an IOU is basically an asset backed security. Because you say this IOU we're trading here is backed by this asset, which kind of by definition could make it an asset backed security. Yeah, I guess it depends who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Arthur, thanks for the great talk. Uh, could you go into detail of what keeps the uh, NoCast server honest with regards to its collateral? In the sense of, is there any mechanism that prevents the NoCast server from inventing liquidity until its next jet, jet point? I don't know, I'm thinking about a scenario where I extend invented liquidity, so invented tokens that, that just don't exist in a smart contract to an exchange. Uh, gets credited there, and maybe do it on two or three accounts, something on the market, and before the next checkpoint of the server comes around, I reverse the process and take some so take some profits from that. Uh, at, at the chain of, of receiving and sending uh, seems, seems to me for me to have not have that element. And the second question, uh, I think, as any off chain solutions, uh, you, you kind of suffer from the problem of minor censorship. So if the if the, the challenge anything either from the hub side or from Clients that get censored, the uh, whole thing doesn't work anymore. Maybe you can uh, give us your thoughts on that. Sure, very good question. Um, so the collateral, so um, every the whole collateral is actually on chain. So this means um, if you want to audit the smart contract state, then you just look at the blockchain. So you can't kind of invent any any collateral there, right? If you're a user of the particular hub. So you're, uh, I mean, you're a user and you want to receive within 72 hours, you want to receive 10 Ether in an instant finality manner. Then the hub, what he needs to do is to allocate for your particular account 10 Ether, right? And then you know up to 10 Ether, I can receive trustlessly instantly. So where's this recorded? So these 10 Ether, they are basically allocated on the smart contract. Um, and the amount of collateral that you receive or that you can receive trustlessly is allocated within this balance structure here. So I, I omitted those details in this presentation, but the particular amount that an account number one, for example, can receive trustlessly is encoded within this structure. Right. So this is your first question. Um, the second question was about um, censorship. censorship. Ah, yes. Um, I believe that's an easy one because if we don't need to do many transactions, right? We need per month, at, at least at this checkpoint time interval, we do 20 transactions per month. I could even run my own miner that achieves to make 20 transactions per month. And if I'm running on proof of work, I can, I can just push them through. Or I can pay some particular miner that has a very low uh, hashing power, but they will get my transactions through uh, in time. Yeah. It might be an issue if, it will be an issue if the, if, if the server is being challenged. So. Let's say uh, a client like you, you want to kill the server, 
what you will do is, hey, you, you, you lied about my account, right? So you send an on-chain transaction. And the here, the, the server will need to respond within a time frame to this challenge. If he doesn't, this smart contract will say, hey, you didn't respond me in time, I'll kill you. Um, so this is basically where this might get critical uh, regarding minor censorship. So certainly that's in a concern. But the beauty of proof-of-work blockchains is that they are kind of hard to censor, right? Uh, at least as you, if you assume 51% are honest. Uh, at least 51%. Um, and this means you just need to get through a few on-chain transactions. Uh, thank you, Arthur, for the great presentation. Uh, question, if somebody that is a member of the hub and would like to pay transact with somebody that is not a member of the hub, does it mean that in this case, kind of the settlement is one day at the hub? So actually he can use the funds only after this 36 uh, payment? Right. Yeah, so if, if I'm off-chain and you're on-chain and I'm sending you something and I'm not collaborating in this transaction with the hub server, then this will take at most 72 hours. I, I mean, depends basically when you start the, the withdrawal, at which process, but at most. Uh, if you, however, collaborate with the server, which you could, then this would go much faster. So what the server can do, he can kind of, what he, he can sell you on-chain Ether and you give him your off-chain Ether, right? And this way, you're kind of cutting this time. Uh, you're cutting this time away. Again, we have the higher fees in this case. And then you have the on-chain transaction fees, and you do have the um, a few minutes of waiting time on Ethereum blockchain. Yes. This the concept of the hub is not really understanding. Is that something which is uh, obviously I need it as a potential client there, so I need to connect with the hub to bring my my funds home. If I want to pay to somebody else who's maybe not connected, is that possible? Or uh, and what would be the incentive for me to run this kind of money? this hub? Mm -hmm. How can I make money there, or why should I do this? Um. So, if you say I want to pay someone else, um, what do you assume for this someone else? Is he like on chain, like a just regular crypto wallet, or what? I want to exchange this IO news. Do I need to, to have kind of a direct connection to the other person or trust the other person who needs obviously to have the same connection, to have a connection to the same uh, uh, hub to, yep. make this, uh, to make this happen if uh, this is possible? So it's more a question about the possible potential routing and so on. So again, what is the position of the hub? Why should I run this? And uh, by the how many person run this kind of So how, how efficient is it? Can we make it work? Okay, um, so a hub can have up to, I don't know, more than a billion users um, and it will still be uh, usable and not too expensive to work with this particular hub if you have a billion users, uh, which, which I showed in, this in the cost analysis. Um, so this means that it can really scale properly, right? Um, I don't know how many users are using blockchain today, probably not a billion. Um, but so this is regarding how big it can grow. So one single instance of this hub. Ideally, we would like to have multiple instances of this hub. So you can run one, I can run one, somebody else can run one. And a user of my hub uh, can do a transaction to your hub uh, or vice versa, right? This would be ideal. Um, that's still future research. And to do this in a trustless way, in a secure way is still uh, being worked on. Um, if you want to do a transaction so at the moment, if you want to do an off-chain transaction, exchange an IU, the two users, so sender and recipient, they need to be on the same hub. Okay. So it can be, uh, for example, two people that have installed the mobile app. They will be automatically connected to the same hub. Um, but yeah, uh, if you want to send a kind of an IU towards somebody that's not connected but has a crypto wallet, like an Ethereum crypto wallet, what you can do is you can kind of send an off-chain transaction to the hub and the server forwards then an on-chain transaction to the recipient. That would work too. But then there's an on-chain transaction fee to be paid. It's not instant, right? So you're using again the underlying blockchain um, as, a, as an intermediary. Uh, why would you run such a hub? Um, good question. Um, it's kind of why would you run a bank? Um, just the disadvantage here is that you don't have, you are not, um, you're not holding the assets of the users, right? So you can't actually make this money uh, work. Uh, so that's a disadvantage for you. 
but you, well, you're offering financial services or you're inter uh, a non-custodial financial intermediary, right? So you have less, less risks because if something goes, goes wrong, so it's not your fault that the money is lost, right? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there's no money lost. I mean, it's not your fault if your service goes down in a sense. So y the users, they won't lose their funds because they remain custodians. Um, so well, how can you make money with this? So either you charge a transaction fee, right? So for example, what we are currently doing is you have 10 transactions uh, for free uh, within uh, seven, I think 72 hours or 36 hours. And if you want to have an unlimited number of transactions, you have to pay a certain fee. Uh, which is which can be paid, for example, in tokens or so. Right. So this is like a, a kind of a per transaction fee, uh, or you can have a service level agreement with a particular um, blockchain app. So I tell this blockchain app, I want uh, we we guarantee you 100 transactions per second for your clients. So that's even more than current blockchains uh, support, right? Uh, so you can do such service level agreements with different providers so that they have a better service for their clients. Right. So this is a way to make money. And ultimately, um, if you're building a DEX or if you're operating a DEX on top of this, then you, will, you can generate uh, transaction fees or trading fees for makers and for takers. For my service, this one, not really um, yeah, but you can have, if, if, you're, if you're running an infrastructure, you will want that the underlying layer is, is robust, right? You want to have some kind of an agreement that if somebody who's running the service for your settlement system is really fast and it's up like 24 seven with five nines behind the, behind the comma of availability. Um, so this is where you, you can pay for having a better service, right? And it's, it's kind of, you can, you can run a hub as a service. Yeah, but if you have some good ideas, I'm also all ears. <laughs> uh, hi, Felix. Uh, thanks for the good talk. Uh, I have a question. If uh, one of the participants um, uh, misses out to challenge one of the states, so I, uh, there is a state where I lose a lot of money and I miss out to challenge it, and then there is a new state which, based on the old state, which was not correct, but based on that it is correct, can I then challenge the new state? Do I have to change the old state, or did I just miss out and now it's uh, just like that? Um, I believe currently in the implementation that we have done, if you miss out, you miss out. So it's your fault. Because you have to, you have to move forward right, at some point in time. You can't like, roll back forever. Um, so that's why there's an online availability requirement of you have to be online at least once every 36 hours. Um, which is better than payment channels, right? Two-party payment channels, where you have to be always online. Um, but you can also use, similar to payment channels, you can use uh, watchdogs. So I can pay you, and you're gonna watch for my balance, right? This is something that, that, uh, that you actually need for, for Lightning, for example. You, this is an absolute must, because clients are not always online, right? They are online a lot, but not always. Um, so basically you're gonna pay a third party. Problem is this third party is kind of trusted because you trust it that it's gonna watch for your balances. Uh, you're gonna trust it that it will issue a challenge if something is go goes wrong with your balance. This trusted third party knows all your transactions, so privacy. Um, and this trusted third party, if it's colluding with someone, uh, then it, it can actually steal your funds. <laughs> so um, in, in liquidity, if you have this trusted third party, um, it would need to be online once every 36 hours. You could pay like maybe two, three to lower the odds that one of them is malicious, right? Because if they don't do anything, then they're malicious, right? Uh, but if they do something, then they're good and you need at least one who reacts. Yeah. Good, good question. Uh, so in the current implementation um, that we have on the mainnet, only the owner of the account can do the dispute. But this is just for, for current spam mitigation. Um, but in the, from the design perspective, you don't need the private key. No, this would be too much. Yeah. So it's basically enough if I know your transactions, right? So I know everything that you're transacting. And I can check here in this structure, actually. So if you have account one and I have account two, I only need to see whether you have still 10 Ether. And if you do, a, like, I don't know, a one Ether transaction, off-chain transaction somewhere, then you should have still nine, right? So I only need to be able to check that. And if that's not satisfied, then I should be able to issue a challenge to the HubSmart contract 
on your behalf. Yeah. Um, actually, one more question. One server can have many hubs, right? Excuse me? Uh, one server can have many hubs. Um, at the moment, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. One server, one hub. What you can, however, have is one smart contract, multiple servers, right? If you want to have redundancy uh, and, and proper reli reliability, actually, on the server side, uh, you will just have a load balancer and then multiple hubs on uh, multiple hub servers on there. Yeah. In this case, is, there, uh, is it possible for members of different hubs to interact without going on chain, to make transactions without going on chain? We're working on this active research. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 actually uh, it's challenging, but it's an interesting thing to to do. I agree. Um, we believe that it's important to get first the base layer right. Right, you want to do you want to have one instance of a hub which is really scalable, really usable, uh, properly to implement uh, to implement it, and, and then once you have this base, then you can start to work on cross hub communication. It's like you. It's basically like building a blockchain, right? Nowadays, blockchains. They're kind of isolated databases. They don't communicate with each other. Exactly. So basically, interoperability between blockchains is very similar to interoperability between hubs from a conceptual point of view. Um, and there are some ways of doing this, right? You lock some funds in one chain, you unlock it in the other chain, and then you transfer, but you have to make sure that you always can go back and so on. It's the same issue. Right, I believe this concludes the evening. Thank you very much, Arthur, for coming and giving us this talk. I'm sure there's a project to watch. Thank you for attending and uh, coming up with questions. And finally, thank you again to, uh, for EY. Uh, they will be providing uh, briefly snacks that you can find outside your next time. Thanks. <laughs>